worship services on this special Sunday morning. Uh, uh, let, let me begin today's word with uh, sharing with you a small story. Uh, a father once was telling his uh, small son the story about the lost sheep. Um, so he was telling the son how uh, the shepherd, leaving back all his 99 sheep, went searching uh, for the lost sheep. So the father explained uh, to the son that one little sheep just crawled out of uh, a hole in the fence, uh, just uh, leaping and bounding outside the fence in the sunshine, playfully wandering away. Uh, just then, um, a wolf was uh, coming out of the woods, trying to snatch the sheep. And all of us know that within, uh, before the wolf could actually uh, take hold or you know, catch the sheep, uh, the shepherd thankfully reached and he took the sheep and put the sheep on his shoulders and uh, took it back to the fold. So as the father was telling the story to his little son, as he just finished uh, narrating the story, he found his little son who was sitting beside him jump out of the sofa, come and sit in front of the father with his two little hands clasped like this and sitting in front of his father and asking his father, Father, at least now was the fence repaired. So, uh, yes, did he asked, did they fix the hole in the fence? The good news is the hole in the fence has been fixed and that has been done by the advent of Jesus Christ into this world. His coming into the world is the fixing of the fence and this is the love of God for us. And this season, as we all celebrate the advent, the fourth Sunday of advent, we are celebrating this love of the Father. So this is the celebration of Jesus' birth and celebration of life. Now around uh, this Christmas time, um, you know, you must have heard this very famous song going around almost in all malls and shopping places. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I'm sure you heard it, right? All of us who watched Home Alone the numerous times, this song keeps uh, playing in the background of the movie. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And certainly it is the most wonderful time of the year because all of us look forward with some kind of excitement in our hearts. You know, uh, everything about Christmas is so uh, joyous and so magical in fact. Well, the songs, the decorations, and for us ladies, the special offers that uh, the shopping uh, places have to give us, you know, uh, they lure us to buy more and more. And uh, some of the ad agencies go to the extent of preaching the gospel also. They say it's not about getting, it's about giving, right? So that we buy more to give. Yes, certainly it is a better uh, option to give during uh, Christmas are gifts of love to each other. But is that the essence of Christmas? Well, giving gifts is not a bad idea, but still it falls far short of what Christmas is truly about. Before we go further into today's word, let's, um, I'm going to give you all a small assignment. I'm trying to catch up with Praveen. Uh, so please take out your phones and in our fellowship group, there's a question that has, that has been uh, posted yeah. uh, on the Mentimeter. Um, so basically, what does Christmas mean to you? So you'll have to answer this question. How can we best celebrate and honor the birth of Christ in this season? How can we best celebrate and honor the birth of Christ in this season? 
So if you can open your fellowship group, WhatsApp group, uh, the question has been posted and those of you who are not in the group, I mean maybe whoever is watching on the YouTube, they can also type the code 47682816 and answer the question. Uh, yes, so we can see the answers uh, on the screen, yes, so we can celebrate Christmas or the coming of our Lord Jesus into this world by spending time with God, yes, being thankful, by giving, sharing the good news, by, yeah, reconciling, loving, talking about Jesus with others, those who have not heard about him yet. Yes, all these are definitely the, uh, the, way, the ways in which we can celebrate the advent of our Lord and Savior. We will come to this little later. You can keep your answers coming in. And um, Maybe we can go back to my slides. Um, this I think we will need at the end. So if you can project at the end, uh, we will see what all the responses were. Brethren, a God is a passionate God. He is an intimate lover. All God wanted from us um, at the beginning of creation and even today is nothing but quality time. You know, all of us know what quality time is, right? And God wanted to enjoy his presence and his company with all of us, right? For this reason, he created Adam and Eve. And he blessed them, saying that, multiply and fill the earth. And we know how the sin crept into this world. Um, and how Adam and Eve ha have separated themselves from the presence of the Lord. But God didn't leave it at that. God gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to bridge this gap of separation. The problem of sin uh, or the sin's darkness was solved, was not just solved at the first Christmas. In fact, the coming of the Messiah has been prophesied many, many years before the actual advent. We all know that, right? And the coming of Jesus Christ was the beginning of God's plan being set into action, being set into motion, or it was the execution of God's plan. Uh, we've seen in the uh, reading today that uh, uh, in John, 1 John uh, verses, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking back again and again. Uh, but chapter 4 verses 9 to 10 this is how God's love for us was revealed God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we may live through him this is love not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins one particular aspect of God's love which is really amazing is the selflessness of, uh, which is the nature of God's love. Now, this is uh, really rare and I, I can say that it doesn't exist in our, our carnal love that we exhibit, right? Um, it is really refreshing to see how God's love is selfless. Often, we do come across love that, that has been expressed to us and most of the time, it is based on some selfish motives, right? Uh, normally, we humans, we, when we are expressing, usually we think, what is there in this for me, right? Uh, but God's love is not like that. God's love is truly, simply, just selfless. And there are no strings attached to it. Now, just for the sake of knowing or just to understand how our love usually is, I'd like to uh, 
uh, I, I'd like all of you to read this uh, funny letter, which was once uh, written by uh, ex-girlfriend uh, to her uh, boyfriend. So uh, <laughs> it, it reads as, Dear Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I felt since breaking our engagement. Yeah. Please say you will take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yours forever, Mari. And under that, the actual intention of her writing back to her ex-boyfriend and congratulations on winning the state lottery. Right? So human love is often based on some selfish motives. Right? It might not be as raw as this, but usually it is based on selfish motives. But God's love is selfless. God's love is true. God's love is love in action and love in obedience. God's love was shared where God had to give away his only begotten son to us. And the obedience of the son, the, Jesus Christ, he was obedient to his father even unto the death on the cross. That is the kind of love our triune God shares in between them and also has shared with each one of us. Our Heavenly Father simply loves and cares for us. Jesus once said that greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his own friends. Just like a mother or a father would not go back or hold anything good for their children, God also did not hold back his most precious gift for us, the son, his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we have numerous occasions uh, whenever somebody asks us, what is love? I think the most common answer would be, God is love. Or some of us may say, God, love is something uh, which is you know, a, an expression of our concern or outgoing concern towards the others in our life, right? If God is love and we are God's children, God commands us to follow his footsteps. Uh, remember, Paul says uh, in Corinthians, um, uh, to be imitators of himself as he is the imitator of of Jesus Christ. So Paul asks us to imitate him because he is imitating Jesus Christ. Ultimately, he is asking us to imitate Jesus Christ, right? So what, how do we imitate God's God and his character? By imitating and showing the love and concern that God himself has expressed for us by expressing our love and concern towards our fellow human beings. Right? Um, uh, and one way in which we can express our love uh, to God is to be obedient to his commands and to his great commission. Um, uh, let me read to you from Matthew chapter 28 verses 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and, the, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, one of the ways uh, that we could express our gratitude or we could share our life, our love with our fellow men is to share the gospel or to uh, or the good news. Love is reaching out and to minister to the lost. Now, how do we interact uh, with an individual who we know is not saved? Right? Many a times this is the most difficult part of our Christian walk, I think. How do we share gospel? When do we share gospel? Is it right for us to share gospel in that particular time? Recently, uh, there was a Christmas um, uh, party in the college where I work. 
and uh, the students were celebrating Christmas and uh, the staff also were there and a speaker, a guest speaker was invited to speak and deliver the message of Christmas in the college. Right, uh, so this lady was a Muslim convert and she came there and she test gave her testimony how she came to know about Jesus and how she accepted Jesus as her personal savior. It's a wonderful way of uh, sharing the good news by, you know, uh, by telling how you have come or how we have come to Jesus uh, and accepting him as our personal savior. But in her speech, uh, she said that uh, Jesus is only, uh, Jesus is the true God and all other gods are false, which is very true. Uh, but all the Hindu uh, colleagues of, who were there, they were really offended by that word. Our principal, uh, the principal of the college who was also seated there, she just got up out of the, uh, out of the gathering and she excused herself on pretext of some work and she just went out. And uh, I had to follow her because I was also helping her out, her out with the, that particular work. But when I reached that place, I heard her speaking to another colleague, how can they say that our gods are false gods? And uh, that is not their fault. We are blessed that our eyes and hearts are open to the truth. We are blessed that we are born in families where we know who the real God is, who God is. In fact, there is no, I think there is no, uh, uh, nothing like real God and false God. There is only one God, right? So they were really offended and they were discussing about this. Well, I really felt sorry about the situation and I didn't know what, how to respond because I was there. And then she said, Joshila, you should have spoken something rather than inviting somebody from outside, you should have given, um, you know, just spoke about, spoke, gave the message or something like that. Like that, she said. I just smiled and I kept quiet because I didn't have an answer right then. And when she returned back to the gathering, she spoke it out on the stage saying that all religions are equal, every, you know, uh, you cannot condemn people. There is no true God and false God. So, in fact, that particular statement, I think, has damaged uh, the reception of gospel among the group. That's what I felt. So when we are sharing gospel to those who are not yet, um, you know, who are not yet um, exposed to the truth, we really have to be very careful. And we have to be very careful with our words. Uh, and does that mean that we don't share gospel? No, we certainly have to uh, spread the good news. But we have to ask God for his wisdom and for his guidance so that we will be able to spread the good news and bring the lost sheep into his fold. So, uh, love. How do we uh, express our love and gratitude to God? Love is reaching out to the ministering, uh, reaching out to the lost Right? Uh, often, here too, we have the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Remember that story in Luke where Jesus uh, goes to uh, visit the house of Zacchaeus? Yes? Right? Uh, Zacchaeus was a person of a very bad reputation in the sense that he was a tax collector and nobody really liked him. He was looked as, uh, as somebody who is not, uh, who, who would, you would not be associated with of a bad reputation basically. But Jesus did not condemn him outright on his face that what you are doing is wrong. He knows what, what Zacchaeus does. Rather than condemning him with words, he went to his house, spent time with him and saw that there was a transformation in the heart of that particular person. So let us follow the footsteps of our Lord and Savior. So let us Spend time with our dear friends who have not yet come to the Lord. Maybe we can express our gospel by the way we live in our offices, in our neighborhoods. And definitely take time to share the good news uh, so that they would come to the Lord, not just by words, but also by seeing our own, our examples. 
right? So the first one, um, how do we express God's love to others is uh, reaching out and to minister to those who are lost. The second point that I would like to bring to your notice this morning uh, is uh, love is praying for your enemies, right? What do you do? What do you say about this? The easy way out uh, in this situation is to you know, respond in anger, um, be unkind, speak out your anger and frustration, hurt them. That's the easy way. But the harder way is to forgive and pray for those individuals. Right? When Jesus was crucified on the cross, when he was condemned by the whole Roman Empire and his own people who left them, Jesus did not, um, you know, he was not angry. He just said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Follow the example of the Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. It is very easily said, but it's really difficult to do. You know, to forgive those who hurt us, those who do something wrong against us, it's not easy. Well, um, a recent, uh, I, I, I've been uh, sharing my uh, experience uh, with, you know, about my promotion and all. Uh, in this uh, situation, uh, there was one colleague a good friend of mine to, to be, you know, um, I can call her a friend of mine actually. But uh, when this entire thing of my promotion being delayed and uh, things were happening, this lady actually took time to go with her high level influence to the office of the director of health, sit in his chamber and recommend why I should not get my promotion. It was not the, my friend, the so-called friend. It was not she went there to recommend, uh, but rather I came to know this later that she actually sat down in his office, got the file removed, and she said why I should not be getting. And she, I mean, she has high level of influence and they put pressure on the director of health not to uh, you know, pass that bill. Otherwise, it would have been signed before my the actual promotion date, but she made sure that my file would not be signed before the actual date of promotion. That really happened. And I came to know about this and I was already shattered, broken. And this thing comes again hitting on my face. Well, I cried and I was really very angry over that lady. Maybe I should be saying this, maybe I cursed, but I not uh, knowingly, but at least I've cried and really hated her. But God, uh, again, uh, he taught me not to hate, but just think, let go of things. Because however you try or whatever the other person try, unless until it's God's will, things will not happen. So I left it in God's hand and saying, God, if she has tried it in her own way, unless you have allowed it, this would not have happened to me in my life. So I leave it at that. So I thought I've forgiven her. I said I am forgiving her. I don't want to talk ill about her. But whenever I came across her, there was that kind of feeling. I just want, didn't want to face her. I wanted to escape her. I didn't want to say hello to her. So these things were happening. But if I really forgave her, I would not have been behaving that, like that. I, in fact... I was also enjoying people talking bad about that lady in front of me. When somebody said that so and so person is like this, like that, I really enjoyed that conversation, you know, in the gossip. Was I being forgiving towards her? No, I was not. E even though I was telling everybody else and telling myself that I forgave that lady for what she has done, that grudge and that hurt was still being nurtured in me by enjoying listening to what is wrong about, you know, somebody talking wrong about that lady. That is not true forgiveness. That is not true forgiveness. This, I came to know just last week and uh, somebody was talking again 
you know she is a very busy lady in high level doing all sorts of things in the profession so again this lady came up in our conversation and uh, and people know that she hurt me huh? so they like to talk bad about her in front of me so that that was happening there then god was saying this is not what you should be doing so i immediately said okay let's leave her topic i'm not interested in listening to her and then god also gave me the realization it is not the person who is actually trying to hurt or you know cause damage to us there is a high you no know, spiritual forces that are working through her in causing us the hurt or damage testing our character it is basically testing our character right whether we are surrendering to that gossip whether we are actually being forgiving whether we are actually being loving towards that other person so love is praying for your enemies forgiving them literally forgiving them right love is praying for your enemies and forgiving them love is the third point that i'd like to bring to you all notice this morning is love is self sacrificing right there are so many schools of thought as to what uh, sacrifice is uh, i ca- i just read uh, in on the net that um, during the season of christmas some radio stations in in the us they ask their listeners to sacrifice a uh, coffee per day usually they drink a lot of coffee i guess and they usually buy so uh, this ra- this particular radio station asked their res- listeners to forgo one cup of coffee every day and donate that money to uh, towards a charity so what these people listeners do is they just uh, you know collect the entire month's uh, coffee money and give it towards a charity well that is certainly a sacrifice definitely if you are addicted to coffee right um yes uh, there are many more types of sacrifices if we can call them sacrifices giving arms helping others um all these come under that uh un- under that category uh, a true sacrifice is sacrificing one's i mean not everybody i don't expect each one of us to sacrifice our lives but uh, an example that i again came across on the net is how sacrifice uh, truly can be done was um, during this world war 2 around 1943 that's what when the world war 2 was happening i guess uh, so the there was one us ship which was uh, going um, to fight with germany so that battleship was carrying around 903 soldiers on it and along with them there were uh, among the other uh, crew and the staff that were going with the soldiers were four chaplains basically pastors you know who would pray and encourage uh, soldiers on the ship when they are deployed so uh, so this uh, ship was a um, uh, named dorchester and uh, this ship was being deployed with around 900 soldiers um, and uh, on february 3rd uh, roughly around midnight a german torpedo hit the ship and the ship started sinking and along with it uh, the soldiers also were going down and there was a lot of panic obviously uh, the ship actually sank within 20 minutes itself it's it it seems so there was uh, not much time for the soldiers to escape into the life boats so everybody were, they were just grabbing on their life boats and um, and the life jackets and getting uh, into the life boats and in this um, chaos uh, these four chaplains were helping uh, soldiers to find their ja- life jackets and get into the boats and as uh, some of the soldiers started departing some of the soldiers they re- really didn't find their life jackets so there was one particular soldier who came to this chaplain young soldier came to the chaplain and asked that i am not and told that he was not finding his life jacket so this chaplain gave his life jacket and sent the soldier on to the life boat like that few uh, the four chaplains had to let go of their life jackets to save 
the lives of young soldiers. Four of them, they helped with their life jackets. And within no time, all the four chaplains went down along with the ship, singing and praising God for the life that he has given them and the service that they were able to offer to their fellow men. These pastors or the chaplains definitely demonstrated a very self-sacrificing love similar to that of what Christ has done for us. So posthumously they were awarded, they were given medals and uh, even postal stamps have been released on their uh, names. So this is one of that. And in an interview later in 1997, one of the survivors of that uh, catastrophe, William Bednar, he uh, said, I could hear men crying, pleading, praying and swearing. I could also hear the chaplains preaching courage to the men. Their voices were probably the only thing that kept me sane. What a selfless act of love. Their love demonstrated just like the love of Christ, even unto the death. So, as Christians, what are we called to? As Christians and disciples of Jesus Christ, what are we called to? Our calling is not easy. To demonstrate this kind of love, this kind of love in our in our day-to-day -day lives is not easy. To be forgiving, to be selfless, you know, to love without any strings attached is not at all an easy thing. Each act of service that we do, each act of service that we do to our fellow human beings is an act of love. The sacrifice of resources, sacrifice of time, energy is a gift of love that we bring to our Savior. Brethren, I come from a church, you now before marriage, I've come from a traditional church the traditional Lutheran background. Uh, my spiritual grooming, I should say, has mostly has happened in this church. Right? Um, I don't want to become very emotional. Yes. Uh, this church has given a lot to, not only just to me, I know all of us have enjoyed the growth and the company and the fellowship with each other as well as with God. I have seen sermons being put into action in this church. I've heard a lot of sermons being preached, but <clears throat> seen sermons being put into action here. Forgive me for this. I've seen my pastor I've been praying, God, I don't want to be emotional, but I think uh, I'm made this way. I'm sorry about this. Yeah. I've seen my pastor wash toilets and dust the empty chairs. I've seen and enjoyed his wife drink coffee, tea, and stacks week after week. For years, without even complaining or without even expressing what a burden it could have been on her time and on her resources. 
I've seen Sunday school teachers get up out of their chairs. Walking into that room to minister to kids at the expense of being ministered themselves. I've seen worship leaders dedicate their weekends, take out time to practice. I've seen children come for practice in spite of their exams and tests. I've seen our worship coordinator leading and planning and assigning responsibilities week after week to participate in the worship services. I've seen members drive other members to distant places whenever it was required. I've seen members fixing up the small little things in the, in the church which needed to be attended. All these brethren or sacrificial offerings. And certainly these are a pleasing aroma to our Lord and Savior. As we close today's uh, message, let me talk to you and uh, speak about a small story that we find. Um, it's actually a book that was written by Henry Van Dyke. Uh, and it is titled The Other Wise Man, you know, basically the fourth wise man. On all of us only heard of the thir three wise men. So this is the story that was written by Henry Van Dyke, uh, The Other Wise Man. There was, it seems, a fourth wise man. He was named Artaban. And he traveled to join the other three on the way to Bethlehem. He also had his gifts. He had a precious ruby, a sapphire, and a precious pearl, which he wanted to offer to his master, his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. On his way to Bethlehem to meet up his other three friends, he was caught by attending to an injured man on the way. He was a doctor himself, knew medicine, so he stayed back and attended that injured man, took care of him and reached the place which was destined for them uh, as a meeting place. He reached late and he missed the chance of going along with the three wise men. He didn't give up there. So he still wanted to continue his journey. So by the time he reached the desert, he found a vast desert in front of him. All he had was his three gifts, precious gifts and a horse. He knew he could not cross the desert on that horse. So he had to part with his, one of the precious gifts that he had, the precious sapphire, which he sold to buy a camel so that he would traverse the desert. And he was able to make it to Bethlehem, but he was a little late. By then, the Mother Mary, the, uh, the newborn Jesus Christ and Joseph, they left Bethlehem because Herod has already instructed uh, his soldiers to kill the newborns. He was very disappointed. He wanted to see his savior, but he didn't know how. As he was walking out of that place, he found a little boy in the hands of a soldier who was about to be slain on the orders of Herod. He just stopped the soldier and said, what would he take to leave that child alive? So he parted with another gift, precious gift that he had. He had to give away the ruby to the soldier to save the life of the little one. He moved out from there. He was wandering still to find his savior. He was never able to catch up. And 33 years later, when he finally came to know where that little boy for whom he took those precious gifts were, he rushed to that place. And this time it was not Bethlehem, it was at Golgotha. The little prince whom he aspired and wanted to see so dearly has now grown up and now he has been condemned 
without any reason and he is about to be killed he thought at least now with the remaining precious pearl that he had thought would be able to rescue his savior he with his pearl precious pearl in his hand rushed towards golgotha but again on the way he came across a little girl being sold as a slave to some, by some roman empire so he gave away his precious pearl to the roman soldiers and bought the freedom of the city and by the time he was able to reach his savior's place the foot of golgotha it was too late jesus was already crucified a huge earthquake shook that place and a big rock hit artaban and he fell to the ground now being old and fragile and a wanderer all his life for the past 33 years he was weak he could not take the injury and he was about to die and with the regret in his heart he was about to close his eyes but he heard a gentle voice from inside which said what whenever you gave your jewels for your fellow men you gave them in reality to me that was the voice of christ artaban died but he had bought his gifts he has brought his gifts to his savior to his king so brethren on this christmas season morning almost tomorrow let's all answer this question once again how can we best celebrate and honor the birth of christ in this season bring him your gifts of sacrifice